So uh, today I want to finish talking about the fracking paper that we were uh, that we started on uh, Wednesday, and then I'll also probably start talking about uh, just some evidence on basically how climate affects health. So when we say climate in this context, we really mean weather. Uh, and so what we're going to be able to measure is the effect of, sort of short-run fluctuations in weather on health, because that's what we actually observe in the data uh, in terms of like long-term climate change. Obviously, we don't know what that's going to look like for another 50 or 100 years. Uh, so the best that we can do is try to sort of extrapolate from uh, the relationships that we observe today between short-term fluctuations in weather and health to uh, project them forward to what you might make forecasts about what you might expect to see uh, based on climate change. So um, to continue with the, the fracking paper that we were talking about, so basically, uh, you know, the author, she has data on um, all these wells in Pennsylvania, which you can see visualized here on the map. Uh, and there's kind of two, uh, two types of wells uh, that, are, that are being plotted here. So um, the uh, green triangles are sort of future wells. They're, they're wells that have had permits issued but haven't actually uh, started drilling yet. And then uh, the, the blue circles are basically active wells. So these are wells that have already uh, been drilled and are currently producing uh, natural gas as of, um, I guess, 2013 is, is I think when the map is, is showing. So um, based on... So, so based on these data, uh, so, you know, she has data on wells, and then she's also going to get data on all of the births in Pennsylvania, and kind of narrow down her data set to just look at uh, births for mothers who happen to live within 2.5 miles of one of these types of wells. And so what she's going to do then is basically compare how births near active sites, uh, you know, what the characteristics of those births are, particularly whether or not they tend to have a higher rate of uh, low birth management, lower half-bar scores, we'll talk about in a minute. So they uh, compare how that, uh, they compare, um, you know, how births uh, near those active sites fare relative to births that are near inactive sites. Um, so the treated group is going to contain babies whose mother's residence was within two and a half miles of fracking site was active uh, during the study period, or active like basically during the, the gestational period for the birth. And then the control group is going to contain babies whose mother's residence was within 2.5 miles of a permitted site, uh, but one that isn't currently active or isn't yet active. Um, so this is a little bit different, maybe, than some of the types of like treatment versus control group uh, choices that we've seen in the uh, in the past. And so I want you guys to think a little bit about you know why, like basically why one might choose the control group this way as opposed to choosing a different control group, and what the potential trade-offs would be. So remember, like the treatment group. I mean, you can also think about how how she defined treatment, right? So everybody who's treated by fracking is basically uh, you know, people who live within 2.5 miles of an active well. Uh, that 2.5 mile cutoff is you know somewhat arbitrary. It's not like there was some specific science that told her I should use two and a half miles. So you can think about sort of also defining the treatment group differently. The control group, though, you know, the potential control group is it could be as large as like every other person in the state of Pennsylvania because she has or every other person in the state of Pennsylvania because she has data on all of those births. Um, but clearly, she doesn't use that. She limits it. Uh, uh, she really narrows it down a lot to just looking at uh, births for babies who's uh, births for mothers uh, who live within 2.5 miles of a permanent site. Um, so I want you guys to think a little bit about sort of you know why one might make that choice and. Um, you know, whether or not, if you made a different choice, sort of what the trade-offs would, would be. So basically, you know, if you made a larger control group, what you think the potential trade-offs uh, would be there. So I'm just going to have you guys discuss that maybe five minutes in your groups. I don't know, some of the cases, like, are you like a group of one right now? <laughs> uh, is group uh, group eight behind you? How many, you guys have like three or something? Okay, you can join into the group eight. You guys will get like a little credit. Um, okay, so uh, so just think about that for like a few minutes, and then um, I'll, I'll ask for a couple groups to volunteer and, uh, and you know, get their, their thoughts. Is there anybody else who's a group of one, effectively? No way. Here too. That's fine, you can have a discussion. <laughs> if you guys want to join up into, yeah, if you want to join up, uh, merge into like two groups right there. So I think the green future ones because uh, yeah because the um remember if we go back like a few more slides at the time series and essentially like prior to two thousand six or something there were basically zero wells at all in the, the state. Uh, okay, so why don't why don't we uh why don't we discuss what you guys uh, sort of thought about this? I mean I guess I'll ask for volunteers, but we have so few large groups at this point that maybe small groups will uh, bother site. Uh, does anybody want to volunteer to go first or should I randomly pick somebody? 
Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so actually, before you guys start, let me just say, um, you know, I think this is this is kind of like a tricky paper in terms of how uh, she's constructing the treatment and the, the control groups. Uh, so you know, I don't I really don't think there's like a, uh, a right answer here. I mean, there are definitely wrong answers, but um, there's not a unique right answer. And uh, I don't think um, it, it's definitely not straightforward. Let me just leave it at that. Uh, so you know, to the extent that you guys all come up with very different thoughts, uh, I don't think that's uh, so. Group seven plus eight. What were you guys thinking? Yeah, so I mean, I think the um, I think the use of the inactive sites is kind of clever in the sense that uh, you, know, you could basically you think like the location of the wells is definitely not random, right? So you don't you certainly don't want to compare people who are uh, living near a well to like just some like the average person that's living there, or something like that, right? Um, and uh, so there's sort of several reasons why the wells like why you could think that people who live near the wells are very different than people who don't live near wells. Uh, one of them is just simply so the geology. You know, as you're saying, that like the, the shale itself seems to sort of run mostly through the rural area. Uh, the other is that if you live in an urban area, you're not, just sort of the economic situation, even if there is shale underneath like Philadelphia, which in that map I don't think there is, but even if there were, like you're not going to, if you live in an apartment, like, you're going to sell the rights to a drilling company to drill in your like living room or something like that, right? This can only happen in uh, rural areas where there's like a lot of land and not that much housing. Um, so, so she needs to sort of you know find some comparable areas that look similar but aren't actively under development. And the, the use of the inactive wells that presumably will uh, come into development in the future uh, is kind of a clever way to do that. Um, so, uh, so I do think. I mean, what she did made a lot of sense. Um, I don't did. So you guys basically agreed with the strategy? Is that the long short of it? Okay. Was there anybody? So you guys seem to be discussing like potential well, alternatives, but. Oh, I see. So you're saying, like, ideally, you'd want to sort of drop out, if you could see far enough in the future, you'd want to drop out uh, permanent wells that just never actually went into production. Well, yes, but also wells that actually went into the oil industry. As. Oh, I see. And so then there would be a. Yeah, so I, I think, um, again, I think there aren't, I don't think there are sort of active, like, ones that turn on and then turn off and then turn back on in her data. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm only 99% sure that's not the case. I just have a logistical question. How many wells does the So that's, that's a good question. Uh, let me actually go back here. There's a slide that, for some reason, I think on. Uh, on Wednesday didn't make it in just because I opened up like a previous version or something like that. So, uh, so the idea is that it would come in through water, uh, but it's not it's not clear exactly at what points that would occur. So, you know, we had so I had the slide before this one in here where it showed like how you drill down this little water table and so forth. Um, and, uh, and so this is you know this also shows like a potential well, um, but it has a little bit more detail uh, about the various points at which the chemicals uh, and or like uh, the methane could uh, penetrate into the, the water table. So, so one thing you might think is that it would like come all the way up from where they're so they drill very deep. They're like a mile or more down, uh, and then they're fracturing the shale down there. So there you can maybe percolate all the way up to the, the uh, water table. Uh, that doesn't, I think the general consensus is that's always unlikely to happen given the depth and the fact that there's all this you know, rock and so forth in between uh, the, the well itself and that depth and the water table. Um, another possible way is to uh, basically, if they make this, so there's a casing. So this is true for natural gas wells, it's true for oil wells. But basically, you drill down, so you're, like, you're drilling a hole in the ground, and then you actually insert or construct this big cement casing <clears throat> that goes from the top, uh, you know, from ground level, down to a point that should be well below the water table. Because again, you don't want stuff, you know, be it oil or fluids or whatever, uh, to be leaking into the water table, like through the, the well as you uh, pump stuff out. So the casing is supposed to prevent that. Uh, obviously, if, you, uh, if there were like some, uh, you know, error when they were making the casing, if they made a mistake or something like that, then there could be leakage. Uh, although they, they seem to think that that doesn't generally happen. Uh, then the third way that you could get, um, the third way that you could get uh, contamination of the water supply, basically, uh, when you're dealing with all of the fluids after they come out, right? So they don't, you like, they come out. Uh, you know, some of the stuff is what you want, which is the natural gas and oil. Uh, but then you also have all these like waste fluids and so forth. Uh, you need to do something with those. So like, usually they'll sort of temporarily store them for a while, and then they'll potentially like truck them out or try to treat them on site, and you know, you know then uh, reinsert them or like even pump them way back below ground later on as sort of like a deep storage containment area type uh, strategy. Uh, but I think that's that's sort of sort of like the um, the, the Point at which uh, you can potentially have like the most kind of pollutants uh, or, or um, leakage occurring when you're actually trying to get rid of all the, the waste. Um, so basically, you know, the disposal problem. Um, and, and you could also, uh, you know, potentially you could blow up as well. So you could also have a problem where you actually had an explosion, uh, which would damage the, the casing and, and um, like oil or gas all over the place, which is obviously uh, not uh, ideal. Um, so you know, actually, I guess given the description that I just gave, you also would potentially think that like any effects that you that you might see, some of them could be sort of longer term, right? Like when you immediately start drilling, you might not have a pollution problem, but as the waste builds up and you're like trying to dispose of them, like you might eventually encounter a, a pollution problem. Um, so. Anyway, so getting back to the um, the control group, uh, I think that you know I think that uh, the idea of potentially sort of limiting the um, the permanent but not yet developed wells, like limiting that sample down further, uh, does make sense. Assuming that you sort of had enough time to wait and see which ones eventually got developed and which ones uh, didn't get developed. In her case, you probably just don't have that much time. Um, let me just get back up here. Okay. Uh, did you guys? So you sort of, I don't know. Are you guys one group or are you uh, two groups that are merged together? You're like group five, so four, four. Okay. Um, did you guys have any other thoughts, like thoughts regarding uh, control, like uh, control groups, or even how the treatment group was, was defined? Uh-huh. Yeah, so that uh, that's that's kind of an interesting um, point. In this particular study, that wouldn't have an effect unless it was just like 
uh, unless there were sort of purely like a stress and anxiety effect, which is technically possible. So the, the reason is that they, they don't actually conduct a survey in this one. Um, they're collecting like obviously administrative birth record data. So uh, the, I mean, I, I'm sorry, I haven't shown you the outcomes yet. So I'm not know that, but uh, uh, but uh, they're basically gonna look at like the birth weight of the babies and their after scores, which are like where they kind of like, poke and prod the babies after birth and see how they respond. Um, and so there's not gonna be sort of like a direct placebo effect in terms of the like mother's um, sort of reaction to, to the you know the, the development of the um, cracking site. Uh, what they yeah, but I, okay, so, so I guess, you know, in theory, if they knew that it was coming and were, like, stressed out about the fact that there was going to be a well drilled, uh, you know, their next door neighbor's property or something like that, then you could think potentially that caused some sort of stress or anxiety that might have an impact on the babies. Um, there is also another paper, which I don't, which is not on the syllabus here, but one that basically looks at the effect on property values uh, of uh, being near a, a fracking site. So it's kind of, you know, it's a little bit similar to the leukemia paper, except in this case, the, the negative is the, the drilling rather than, um, like, a cancer cluster. Uh, and it does find a drop in uh, property prices. And so that, like, if you're using that as an outcome in this study, then definitely you would think that, like, the permitting, the, the permitting alone would probably already be negatively impacting property prices because you'll anticipate there would be a well and therefore would be willing to pay less for, for the, the house. Um, and then, so I think you guys are the only guy, people who haven't. Uh, did you guys have any other comments or ideas about So when you say every case of inactivity, you mean like uh, you mean areas where there just aren't wells at all, and like never will be wells. Right. Yeah. So yeah. So I mean, I guess you know the 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 um, sort of recurring theme, uh, which which is absolutely you know, the right one, is essentially that these um, you know, these permitted wells that aren't under active well yet sort of give you like a, a signal of of areas that should be similar to the treatment area but aren't actually being uh, treated yet. So uh, so I guess the only other thing that, that I would say is that you could think about. Um, well, I guess so, the, so first of all, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, the 2.5 mile cutoff is you know is arbitrary. Uh, so you're basically assuming that whatever effects on um, you know, whatever like pollution happens is, is probably going to uh, drop off to insignificant levels by two and a half miles. Uh, but she does actually have some evidence on how the effects might vary based on distance to the well, so I'll show you guys that in a moment. Um, then the other thing is, you know, you could, so right now what she's doing is sort of like, go back, I guess, to the, we go back to this, uh, you know, this map. So what we're kind of thinking of, this isn't, this doesn't actually pertain exactly to her study period, so it's not, um, this isn't literally true, but the, basically what we're thinking of is that like, you know, these green circles are like the treated areas, at least at this point in time, and then the blue, sorry, the blue circles are the treated areas at that point in time, and the green triangles are like the control areas at that point in time. And, um, you know, and so, you can see that there's like a lot of overlap between these two these two uh, groups, which is which is good. Um, you know, we want to see that they are in fact coming from generally similar areas. Um, another way that you might have thought of like sort of defining the control group, which would be more similar to say like the uh, Curry and Walker paper that we uh, talked about that uh, was looking at the easy pass uh, implementation, would be that you could have like uh, you know this is like an active well, and uh, and then here's an inactive well. And so she's drawing like a radius around this active well, and saying that you know, that's where I think that's going to occur. And if you were pretty confident about this radius, then maybe you would sort of draw an even larger radius around it and have that be like the total control group. Um, so you know, these are people who must be geographically proximate to the, uh, the, the people who are in the treatment group and how we find it. Um, but if we really think that the treatment group extends like 2.10 more than 2.5 miles, then they shouldn't be affected by this. So you could have thought about sort of you know, choosing people who you know are geographically proximate as opposed to people around the inactive well who uh, kind of like an expectation. You're, you're, you're going to think that they're kind of like in a similar rural area and stuff, and I think that's probably true. Uh, but, but you're not like guaranteed that these two, these two groups have to be especially close to each other. Um, so I think, you know, I think there could have been an argument for kind of uh, doing Drawing like a larger radius around it and, and saying like you know I'm going to also treat these people as a control group. The, the concern that you have, the main concern that you have with this uh, would be, would probably be that like you're not sure that, that, that the treatment is only going to extend two and a half miles. So it might actually be spillover leakage into your control group, which is not going to be a control group. Uh, the other problem would be there's just really something unique about like being right on the site of the well or the, the future well that makes people very different than people who are you know, five hundred miles away. Oh, no. so there are people Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, because somebody owns the land, right? And somebody's getting, uh, so somebody's getting like royalties from it yeah, too. Um, so that that is a good question, uh, and I, you know, I don't know, I'd have to take a, another look at the paper and see whether or not she discussed that at all. Um, uh, because you do, you would think. I mean, two and a half miles is uh, is a pretty big radius. Um, so you know, pi r squared. I guess that would be something like twenty square mile uh, area. What, what's not totally clear to me about this as well is just like so if you know that if you know that you're on top of the of natural gas, right, and your neighbor uh, is like drilling a well, then at that point it seems like you might as well drill the well because like you're, you know you're going to be exposed to contamination anyway if your neighbor's doing it, so you might as well share in like profits. Uh, so I don't really understand exactly how that dynamic plays out. I mean, I also don't know enough about sort of the mineral rights, like you know who has rights to the gas and whether they're competing with each other or what. Uh, but you would think you'd almost like you'd almost expect to see like clusters of wells right next to each other. 